All right, guys, what's going on? Welcome in. So in this one, I wanted to really talk a little bit about the edge position, a critical, critical position in this 4-3 Robert Sala defense. And of course, we brought in Carl Lawson. That is fantastic. Multi-year contract. He's young enough to where he still has room to grow. I can't wait for it. I really do feel like Carl Lawson's best is yet to come. So really, really excited for the future. But with the edge position, again, in this defense, we need two. We need two guys off the edge that can consistently get after quarterback. Backs. And right now, Carl's big Carl's gonna lock down one side, but the other side doesn't have that clear cut favorite heading into training camp, heading into preseason, and then of course the regular season. So, with that said, let's talk about some candidates that we could very well see take that next step as a starting defensive end. So, let's dive in. So let's start with some of the guys that are currently on the roster. I personally feel like there's four guys that could take that next step this season. Let's start with the newcomer, Vinny Curry. Okay, Vinny Curry's coming in from Philadelphia. Super Bowl champion Vinny Curry, I should say. I mean, this is a guy who's definitely had some success in the league, right? Whether it's getting after the passer, setting the edge, uh, performing in the run game. I've always liked Vinny Curry. His game has always stood out to me. Uh, now, he's never really been that dominant edge rusher, like a Von Miller, a Khalil Mack, anything like that, uh, where he's, you know, racking in 13, 14 sacks a season. That's not really Vinny Curry's game. He's never exceeded more than nine sacks in a season and let's be honest that number is a little concerning especially because you take a look at what year those nine sacks came in 2014 a long time ago right another really important quarterback metric is quarterback hits he had 18 great number that's an awesome number career high but it was back in 2017 okay so i feel like at this point in his career even though vinnie curry fits the 4-3 defense he's seen a lot of nfl football he has the size to play the position and he's won a Super Bowl championship with Joe Douglas with the Philadelphia Eagles, so he knows what a winning team looks like. I feel like Vinny Curry is a guy that can step in and hold down the fort for a year and be that bridge guy. I don't think Vinny Curry is the answer at the edge position. Maybe for the season, maybe to start the year off, maybe, maybe halfway through the year, Vinny Curry will be the starting edge guy. But long term, I just don't see Vinny Curry snagging 12 sacks this season, 11 sacks this season, nothing crazy like that. But... I do like Curry a lot, and I think he can. I think he can man the position for now. Next up, Bryce Huff, and I got to be honest with you, I really, really enjoyed watching Bryce Huff last season. I always felt like he played with this heightened level of aggressiveness, uh, flew around the football field, just always wanted to make his physical presence known. And I mean, this guy, when you look, when you watched him back at Memphis, he was an undrafted free agent. At Memphis, he was an absolute monster. Tackles for loss. He was aggressive. He would just hit so hard. Uh, the pass rushing numbers were there nine and a half sacks in 2018 six and a half sacks in 2019 played and contributed in all four seasons he was at memphis really the only question mark with bryce huff is he a system fit now he has the speed he has the power he has the hit power he has the motor he has the aggressiveness all really 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 good traits really attractive traits but is bryce huff tailored more so to a 3-4 system as a stand-up edge rusher a stand-up outside linebacker that's really the only question mark here but at the end of the day of course it's robert Sala's decision how he views bryce huff in this defense uh but really that's to me that's the only question mark because i i i truly do believe in bryce huff i think he has a high ceiling and i really like the potential next up john franklin myers six foot four 285 a huge huge defensive lineman here uh, i personally felt like jfm flashed last season I, I i felt like he always was able to kind of get in the backfield three sacks in 15 games and he was dealing with learning a new system learning a really a new position Position because he was rushing from the interior a lot and i i kind of think that jfm's skill set honestly I, I think jfm's production would go up if you put him back as a 4-3 edge rusher so it'll be interesting to see what robert sala's take on it is because at the end of the day we were a 2-14 and team and i don't want to say anybody's uh roster spot is safe but I got to imagine, JFM, man, he has the size, the potential. He has a lot of strength. He made some plays last season that you're watching, you know, you're watching the game with your buddies and you're looking at him saying, John Franklin Myers can play, dude. Like this guy, this guy can be a ball player. So at the end of the day, we'll see how Salah views the situation. But I'll, I'll just say this about Myers. I think the ceiling is high in a 4-3 defense. I really, I, I wouldn't sleep on that. I really, I truly wouldn't. 
Next up, a former third round pick made by Joe Douglas in the 2019 draft class, Jabari Zuniga, 4-3 edge rusher from Florida. Five sacks in 2016, four sacks in 2017, six and a half in 2018, three sacks in 2019. Now, I was excited about this pick, right? Third round pick, Zuniga's coming in as a third round pick, tons of power, tons of strength. He was a core piece on the Gators defensive line, got into the opponent's backfields, tackles for loss were there. But it's kind of puzzling that Joe Douglas took this, took Zuniga, knowing that he does not fit the 3 4 system at all, knowing we will be running the 3 4 defense. So he had, he played in eight games and had three tackles. Eight games, three tackles, no sacks. The, the production was, n there was no production at all. And a lot of this, a lot of the 2019 draft class, I feel like we're saying, where is this guy? Where is this guy? And who knows? Maybe it's because of Gase, right? I mean, I feel like we have these conversations about James Morgan. We have these conversations about Cam Clark. It's like we're taking all these players relatively early, right? 2019 draft class. But then there's like no plan. Once they get to the Jets locker room, there's like, okay, well, we took these players, but we're not going to use them at all. Concerning, concerning for sure, especially because these players are coming in at huge positions of need. But anyway, in a 4-3 defense, I do feel like Zuniga's numbers will go up because at the end of the day, like we talked about before, he has the strength, the power, and I do feel like Zuniga can set the edge, especially in the run game. Setting the edge in the run game, I feel like Zuniga can do that. I don't feel like he'll ever be a dominant pass rusher. Um, I, I That's just be, me being honest, but you never know with Robert Sala. I mean, who really thought Kerry Hyder was going to pop off? Who really thought all of the, you know, all of the defensive linemen that had success for the 49ers were going to put up those numbers? I mean, outside of Nick Bosa, I mean, there's a lot of players on that defensive line for San Francisco that contributed. A lot of that was because of Salah. So I don't want to write anything off, but Zuniga, I can see a guy because he still has that ceiling. I could see Zuniga coming in and getting some snaps at that other edge position just because of the system fit. He did not fit the 3-4 at all. So now let's switch lanes and talk about some guys that are still available, guys that are still out there on the open market that aren't going to be commanding big money contracts, anything crazy like that. So the first guy up is Vic Beasley, former top 10 pick, a guy that came in as a rookie, looked pretty good, popped off his sophomore year, 15 and a half sacks, dominated the NFL, looked like one of the premier pass rushers in the league for years to come. And then after that, five sacks, year after that, five sacks, and never truly got back to that sophomore form. And it's kind of unfortunate because nobody really knows why Vic Beasley, uh, why Vic Beasley just kind of fell off. Now, he was still somewhat productive, um, but I've talked to a lot of Falcons fans and, you know, some say, hey, he was good for a short time. Some fans will just go as far as to call him a bust. Personally, I feel like he would be. Uh, he's worth a shot. He's he's worth a, a a tryout, right? Let's just get him in the building and let's just see what he has. Salah has a track record for maximizing talents on the defense side of the football, for taking guys on the defensive line, specifically pass rushers, and really getting the best out of them. Vic Beasley still has the speed. He still has the potential. Now, 2020, last year, this is this is why people are off on on why people are kind of off the Vic Beasley bandwagon. And and why he's not currently on a team because he spent time with two teams played in 10 games and had zero sacks all right so the production last year non-existent he was with the raiders and the titans but at the end of the day vic beasley has shown he can dominate this league at a very young age so i'm not saying we need to sign him to a multi-year deal not saying anything like that at all i'm not even saying that we should sign him but i definitely want the jets to pick up the phone and let's just let's just explore the option. Let's just see what he brings to the table. You never truly know. And by the way, Vic Beasley played with Dan Quinn in Atlanta, who runs a very similar system to Dan Quinn, Robert Sala. Okay, so I do feel like Vic Beasley can fit that system as that 4-3 edge rusher, maybe not as the starting guy, right? Just the guy that will be in there every single snap, uh, but more so as a rotational piece that you can kind of get in there and just cycle in with other guys throughout the course of the game. So anyway, again, not saying Vic Beasley deserves some mega deal, nothing like that, but I think he deserves a call. So the next player is kind of interesting. It's Dion Jordan. Now I know what you're thinking, Dion Jordan. I, uh, you know, he didn't work out for Miami. Drafted way too high. They traded him to go get him at third overall, and the production never mirrored what he did at Oregon, what he did in college, because he was a he was a physical phenom in college. He was dominant. But he comes to the pros, highly thought of by everybody. A lot of people love this guy, and the stats weren't even 
average. They were like below average at best. And it, there was a lot of a lot of question marks. Nobody I, I always felt like what like what's happening with Deion Jordan? Why isn't the production there? But anyway, last season he was with the San Francisco 49ers. He had three sacks. So he he fit from a you know an on-paper standpoint, Deion Jordan does fit the fit the 4-3 system and Robert Sala has shown in the past a level of interest in bringing Deion Jordan in at the end of the day as much as we want to say Deion Jordan is a bust and everything like that there's still some traits there that can be worked with now of course I'm not saying that he's going to come in and leapfrog the roster to earn a starting spot right off the bat nothing like that but he, he knows Robert Sala. He's played in the system before. He had three sacks last season. From a depth perspective, I do think it makes I, I do think it makes sense to a certain certain degree. Last but not least, former BYU Cougar Ezekiel Lanza. Now, funny enough, Anta has some of the positives that Vic Beasley brings to the table and some of the positives that Dion Jordan brings to the table. Much like Vic Beasley, at one point in time, Anta was a premier pass rusher in this league. He had 14 and a half sacks one season. He followed it up with an average to an above average season. And then he had 12 sacks the year after that. So at one point in time, Ansa could get after quarterbacks, right? He had the speed. He has he, he had insane size, insane physical measurables, uh, just like a combine warrior and whatnot. That's what shot his stock up because he he was so raw coming out of BYU. That's what I, rem I remember Detroit taking a chance on him. And he comes to the Lions, and once he started to get rolling, it was so much fun to watch. But much like Deion Jordan, Ansa spent last season with the San Francisco 49ers. Okay, now even though the the the, the overall production wasn't there, the common denominator is Robert Sala. There's something in Robert Sala's mind that is saying, I can work with these guys. They fit the system. There's something there. I, I think I can maybe bring something out of them uh, or maybe get them in Ezekiel Ansa's case back to the form that they once were or even something close to that. I mean, if you can get a guy at this point in free agency or, or I shouldn't say free agency, but the offseason and he comes in and gets nine sacks. That's a win. That is a huge win. So I'll leave it there. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comment section about this edge position. Who do you want starting next to Carl Lawson on the defensive line? Or I shouldn't say next to, but opposite of Carl Lawson at that edge position. It's a crucial the position's key. We have to get after quarterbacks next season. Is it somebody that we talked about? Is it somebody on the roster? Maybe it's another free agent that we didn't bring up in this video. So can't wait to hear it. Thanks so much for watching. And as always, go Jets. Thank you.